Dear nephrology colleagues around the world, welcome to the LIFE 2021 Nephrology Campus. My name is Peter Stenwickel. I'm a professor at the Karolinska Institute in Stockholm. And I chair this nephrology campus together with Christoph Wanner from the University Hospital Würzburg in Germany. And we are proud to present to you a series of 18 webinars on current trends in nephrology. Before we start with the talks, I have some housekeeping rules. You as an attendee, you are automatically muted and invisible. But please feel free to ask questions via question field in GoToWebinar at any time. So today we have webinar number 18. And I'm proud to welcome two distinguished speakers, Dr. Franklin Maddox from Fresenius Medical Care, North America, United States, and Dr. Stefano Stewart, also Fresenius Medical Care headquarters, but in Germany. And they will present on perspectives from a large dialysis provider and the lessons learned from 18 months after the COVID-19 pandemic. So, Dr. Franklin Maddox, it's an honor for me to introduce you to give the first talk, and you will talk about the Fresenius Medical Care COVID experience, burden, impact, and outlook. Please. Thank you very much, Professor Stenvenkel, and I appreciate the chance to give all of you a little bit of insight into how we globally have looked at the coronavirus and COVID uh, experience at Fresenius Medical Care. Dr. Stewart will later dive a little bit deeper down into the experience within Europe uh, and our EMEA region. Let me begin first by simply my disclosures. I am an employee of Fresenius Medical Care and a member of the management board as its global chief medical officer. I also sit on a variety of other boards in the, um, uh, in the kidney care and nephrology space. Um, let's first talk a little bit about the burden that we've seen and just give you a picture of what our experience looks like by region. As you know, we operate in four regions around the world. North America, EMEA, Asia Pacific, and Latin America. And this aggregates at any time to about 350,000 patients uh, with end stage kidney disease receiving renal replacement therapy. As you can see from the beginning of the pandemic on the left in early 2020, uh, our experience uh, has gone through uh, what is now four waves. And you will see that those waves have been uh, quite dramatic in. Um, uh, at least three of the four um, continents where we operate. In Asia Pacific, we've seen the most uh, uh, dramatic experience most recently in the, in the more recent months. This is data through mid-August of this year, and you can see that we're right in the middle of uh, the uh, increases that have occurred as related to the, uh, the Delta variant and uh, the current uh, expansion of the pandemic. This is what our infection rate looks like in both suspected or confirmed COVID cases in patients that we've cared for. This is uh, just under 79,000 total patients with the distribution that you've seen here as of uh, late August. Uh, and this represents, again, if you look at our general prevalent populations, a little over 20% of the population, or one in five patients have had uh, exposure to coronavirus. Some have asked whether this, is, uh, this pattern is true uh, in, uh, uh, in all of the demographics of our patients. And in fact, you can see the same patterns that have occurred through uh, uh, late June when we looked at it by age uh, in pure number of cases as well as case rates. And uh, these rates recognize that independent of uh, age group, uh, we're seeing that the virus uh, has impact and in, uh, incidence of infection. And in fact, that incidence of infection is completely consistent with the uh, background rate of uh, infection that the communities are where patients are living. 
we move on to look at uh, what we're beginning to see with uh, differentials in vaccine rates within patients, you can clearly see, and I'll talk about breakthrough infections a little bit later, but you can see the uh, most recent surge is substantially uh, impacted by several several fold higher, a um, increased number of patients that are unvaccinated that are not yet to be vaccinated that are impacted by this. And clearly these are trends that are consistent with uh, uh, what's seen in uh, many different countries around the world, as well as in uh, many different communities, locales where the infection is occurring. How have we responded to this? And I'll just speak briefly a little bit about some of the things that uh, our global medical office has done to, um, uh, to understand this disease. As you all uh, clearly know, none of us really knew much of anything about this particular virus back in the early part of 2020. And so our ability to have experience from each of the four regions where we operate uh, has greatly enhanced our ability to come together as a, a medical department and in fact, understand what some of the trends and experience were that enhanced our ability to make decisions on uh, what to focus on. So we focused very early on personal protective equipment uh, in masking both patients and staff and uh, avoiding some of the issues that would come from communal environment, transportation and other such things. We created a crisis website that took our individual regional websites and knowledge and uh, brought that together in one place. Uh, we had a number of global medical advisories as well as local medical advisories that were addressing issues that have come up uh, related to access to care, access to um, dialysis uh, availability and care, and uh, certainly uh, as the virus has evolved and we've learned about it, uh, has expanded sort of our understanding and knowledge uh, as a global medical community around that. This has included daily updates of literature scans from our medical information and education group. It's also included a, um, a constant uh, evolution of uh, what is the research related to coronavirus that we look at on a series of weekly calls, as well as weekly focuses related to coronavirus that are occurring uh, in each region. Uh, each region has its own crisis response team because the regional experiences are unique to those regions. And I think Dr. Stewart will talk a bit about the experience in uh, the EMEA region. Uh, but at the same time, we've also participated in uh, publishing uh, around 12 to 15 uh, different articles, uh, either on research that we were involved with or ideas that we had, uh, some of which have actually included even application of novel techniques for identifying trends in COVID patients uh, that were submitted to the Kidney X program. Uh, this, among other things, has been sort of an aggregate response to a very steep learning curve that we've had around the virus. I want to talk a little bit about impact and focus really, and, and I will use North American data for this part of the discussion, but it is extrapolatable in other areas, and you'll see data specific to Europe from Dr. Stewart's talk later. When we look at the trends year over year, and we look at 2017 through 2021, you can see the spikes that occurred and uh, all-cause mortality created the area under these curves as the excess death rates that we've seen from coronavirus. And you can map these uh, very distinctly to the, um, uh, to the surges that were seen in the pandemic. And uh, as we ran this through the middle of, not quite the middle of this year to get to our, the end of the second quarter, um, although we had reduced uh, the excess mortality rate, it's not completely gotten back to the, uh, to the, um, uh, the baseline years of 2017 to 2019 uh, as a uh, recognition of this most recent surge predominantly with the Delta variant in most of our locales, um, representing uh, well over 80%, in some cases, well over 90% of, uh, of the cases that are seen. Uh, 
If you look at this pattern, I want you to remember it when we look at the general population pattern. This is the deaths per thousand people on a rate case rate base from the Centers for Disease Control in the US. And you'll see that the, the pattern that is seen in this is almost identical to the pattern that, that we've seen in our own patient population. Looking further, we looked at these um, death rates and how they looked across the various age groups again, and basically confirmed that in all age groups, there was an excess death rate that occurred, not to the same extent, but certainly uh, this was not strictly uh, related to uh, the elderly population, although those were uh, the population of patients that were most impacted, especially early in the course of, of the disease. I want to talk about vaccination for a minute and just give you a sense of where we are today. By region, uh, we have pretty good vaccination rates uh, across the patient population uh, that we have, uh, access to vaccines and uh, our, our need to follow whatever the country level regulatory guidance is on vaccinating uh, people and access to vaccines. But if this has covered all the forms of the vaccine, the mRNA vaccines, the vaccines that are related to more traditional adenovirus vector vaccines, as well as vaccines from uh, both uh, that produced in, in Russia, the Sputnik vaccine and the Sinovac vaccine in the um, uh, in those areas where we are operating. But generally, we have seen a, a substantial um, uh, acceptance rate amongst our population of patients, uh, but still remain concerned about the, um, uh, the unvaccinated population of patients that are at risk with uh, the Delta variant. It is uh, now an ongoing discussion. We recently put out a, a uh, uh, guidance paper internally uh, on additional doses and the discussion that's occurring uh, related to both additional doses and booster doses. And again, this is being dictated somewhat by uh, local and country level uh, um, regulation and guidance. Uh, but also our guidance is to recognize that the state of the science recognizes uh, the level of uh, immune response in our vaccinated patients being somewhat attenuated uh, from uh, the general population and the potential need for additional doses to enhance the immune response. Uh, I'll talk about that, uh, some study that we've done in a moment regarding that. This is just to give you in uh, our North American population, a picture of the breakdown of the three primary vaccines uh, that have been given. And uh, you'll see the, the rates of individuals in the North American group that have had exposure to these vaccines. As we look at these vaccines, we also have looked at a relatively small number of breakthrough cases. Again, this is uh, case rates on a weekly uh, rate that's in the you know uh, six to 16 range on a population of patients that's well over 210,000 people. And so the breakthrough infection rate with vaccination has been relatively low. When we did a more intensive analysis of this particular case rate, where we looked at both the vaccine type and the um, uh, a large number of patients, you can see patients uh, with Moderna at 73,000 plus, Pfizer 58 plus, and the Johnson Johnson vaccine uh, just under 14,000. We recognize that the case rates of breakthrough cases in this analysis had remained relatively low, although there is a differential between the mRNA viruses and the um, uh, the J and J vaccine, which is from the more traditional adenovirus vector. As we looked at uh, traditional immune responses to this, these are antibody level responses as we did a study in both Massachusetts and Arizona on this. Uh, this gives you a sense that there is a differential in antibody response to uh, both the mRNA vaccinated patients versus the uh, adenovirus vector based vaccines and uh, the fact that all of these vaccines, we had a high proportion of patients uh, with an antibody response 
but uh, this response was generally attenuated compared to the uh, neutralizing antibody effects from seen in the general population. I think we spent a lot of time as a medical department talking about the cell-based immunity and the potential because we have seen breakthrough infection rates uh, substantially lower in the vaccinated population, uh, maybe even beyond what is seen from strictly the humoral immunity and antibody response. Speak briefly to our employee vaccination, which has been uh, uh, quite different across the regions. Uh, I'm sure there'll be a little more discussion in detail about EMEA with this, of which there's been a really great response. I think the uh, response overall in employees has generally been good, but you can see the impact of uh, essentially the political divide on vaccine hesitancy that we've seen in North America. And this is something that we have de are dealing with on a, um, a daily and weekly basis in trying to encourage uh, more vaccination amongst uh, a staff, especially uh, staff that's considered 1A or front, frontline clinical staff. Um, but it is something that is not uh, related to access to vaccines. It is much more related to decisions uh, of individuals in that regard. And so we looked at uh, what were, did we get any additional assessment of those that either had exposure to COVID within a period of time and vaccination to see if that would enhance our, um, our um, uh, sort of our overall potential of patients to have uh, some immunologic uh, resistance to coronavirus. And so what we saw in looking at this, we calculated uh, these methods looking at cumulative rates of both exposure to the virus uh, from infection, uh, whether it's symptomatic or asymptomatic, and uh, evidence of infection versus uh, vaccination. And what you'll see in this is that there was really very, very little increase that occurred. It was a few percentage points, uh, but not substantial to move the needle into that range that we'd really like to see it, which is obviously north of 80%. Uh, of uh, staff vaccinated. So I will stop there and happy when we get to the questions to respond in any way to give you a sense of what we've seen uh, throughout our network. Uh, but at this point, uh, turn it back over to Professor Stenvenkel to uh, introduce Dr. Stewart, who will speak about our MIA experience. Thank you, Dr. Maddox, for this uh, very interesting uh, presentation. For you out in the audience, I would like to remind you that you should ask questions and you should use the question window to do this. And with this, I am honored to present to you the uh, next uh, speaker. And this is Dr. Stefano Stewart. He will talk about perspectives from a large dialysis provider. Lessons learned from 18 months after the COVID-19 pandemic. Please, Stefano. Thank you very much, Professor Sandwinkel, for your introduction. And also thank you to Dr. Max to present to everybody the status of Fresenius Medical Care in a large scale globally and about the COVID-19 pressure in our dialysis centers. I would like to present the data that we collected in Europe, Middle East, and Africa, uh, showing what we are facing, what we face in the pre-2020, and now what we are uh, analyzing and evaluating in our diagnosis centers together with our physicians. So uh, I, I would like to remember to everybody that unfortunately the 2020 was a very horrible year for everybody. But I would like to say that nevertheless, millions of people changed completely their behavior, or maybe they changed completely their job. Unfortunately, our physicians, our clinical staff, our nurses are continuing to do their job with patient, with empathy, in order to reduce the problems that all the patients are facing at this moment. And I'm referring not only to the COVID-19 positive patients, but also to the COVID-19 negative patients and to their families. So also I would like to say that the trend in healthcare use are changing and researchers are evaluating the impacts of COVID-19 on healthcare value-based and quality improvement programs that adopt outcome measures to assess the quality of care. Indeed, what uh, it is important to highlight that we have to divide what was before the COVID-19 
and what is actually with the COVID-19. So uh, also I would like to mention that uh, these changes are affecting the quality measure score in the future. So what does it mean? For example, if in the past we were evaluated to, eva to analyze uh, the treatment time in dialysis patients, how should we evaluate the treatment time if we have to increase the gene process, the gene measures in our dialysis centers, sacrificing some time the treatment time? So then I would like to mention that we implemented many years ago a quality system in our organization that is called Medical Patients Review. How much the COVID-19 pressure impacted our quality system, our quality activities in all our 29 countries where we are running our diagnosis centers. And finally, which are the lessons learned uh, related to the COVID-19 pandemic crisis? So I would like to remember to everybody that in 2019, Nissenson proposed the so-called hemodialysis quality pyramid, showing which are the most important aspects that physicians, nurses, technicians should take care of managing, treating their patients. So the fundamentals that are represented by the medical care performance indicators, the context programs. So I mean, for example, hydration status management, cardiovascular diseases, complications in diagnosis patients, and then measure of effectiveness. So reduce the mortality rate, reduce the hospitalization, improve the experience that patients are facing during the diagnosis treatment. And what matters most is the quality of life. So everybody should work in order to improve the quality of life of the patients. But I would like to say that now we have the concept of value-based care, that positioning the patient at the center of the attention of everybody, we should improve the medical performances, we should improve the quality of therapies delivered and also reducing the costs. So this is an example of what we uh, got in the previous years before the COVID-19 in terms of fundamentals and complex programs. So you see uh, July uh, in the different years, and, the, and these are the patients in target for different medical care performance indicators. So we were able to improve to double digit patients in target for the different medical care performance indicators benchmark in 2019 with 2010. In terms of measure of effectiveness, we were able to also to reduce the hospitalization in terms of 2.22 days per year for our patients. And also in terms of mortality, we reduced the mortality rate of 30% uh, in our clinics. Finally, in what matters most, we were also able to improve the quality of life of patients uh, in uh, Portugal, improving the clinic improving the achievement of uh, patients in target for the different medical care performance that we are evaluating every month. But then there was the COVID-19 outbreak. Uh, Dr. Magdus correctly presented the impact of COVID-19 in the different region. I would like to mention that EMEA in EMEA, we are uh, present in 29 different countries. And if you see on the right side, you see that among the 20 countries that were really strongly impacted by the COVID-19, there are 11 countries that are in EMEA region. So you can understand which was the impact of COVID-19 in EMEA region. So some data related to the COVID-19 pressure outbreak in our diagnosis centers. So, more than 16,000 patients were infected. Fortunately, around 30,000 patients recovered from the COVID-19. Unfortunately, uh, we uh, observed more than 3,600 deaths in our clinics. And today we have 300 to 80 patients infected. I would like to remember that we are present in 800 more than 100 clinics and we are treating more than 68,000 patients. So if now we are evaluating the number of active patients that we observed in August 2021, we can see that we have exactly the same number that we observed in 2020. So you see in red the evolution of active patients in 2020 and in the blue line, the evolution of COVID-19 positive patients in 2021. So 328 is exactly the same number we had last year. 
which was the impact of COVID-19 in mortality rate in our organization. You see the evolution of mortality rates starting from 2012 till uh, um, June, July 2021. And you see how much the COVID-19 outbreak impacted the mortality rate in our organization, considering all patients and the dramatic increase of uh, mortality rate in incidence patients. So after six years of improvement, you can see the increase of mortality we observed in incidence patients. What does it mean in terms of population that we are treating? So now, if you're going to benchmark the demographic characteristic of patients treated in our diocese center before the COVID-19 and in July 2021, we can see that we have now younger patients, so half year less. And then you can see that for each comorbidity, we have less patients. That also doesn't mean that we have less diabetic patients, less ischemic RTCs comorbidity in, in our patients, less hypertension. So at the end of the story, we are less fragile patients compared to before the starting of the COVID-19 outbreak. So what does it mean that indirectly, this is an example that the COVID-19 was stronger, was impacting mainly the fragile patients that we are realizing in our organization. So I prepared this slide because this is a big compliment that I would like to, to share with all physicians, all uh, nurses, all technicians, all managers that are working in our clinics because we understood how much resilient they were to manage the COVID-19 in the different countries. So I would like publicly thank you everybody for what they are doing, sorry, for what they did, for what they are doing and for what they will do uh, in the fourth wave. What does it mean? First of all, if you are going to benchmark uh, the different June in 2019, 2020 and 2021, we can see that in 2020, we have a dramatically decrease of medical performances in our organization. And this is evaluated by a reduction of patients in target for the different medical K performance indicators. And we have a special score that is called balance score cap patients active problem. And you see that in June 2019, it was 250. Then in May and in June, it dramatically increased. Higher is the value, lower are the medical performances. And again, thank you to everybody in our organization. In June 21, 2021, we got the same medical performances that we had in June 2019. So again, thank you. Already Dr. Maddox presented the um, vaccination uh, status of uh, EMEA patients. So it is correct. Uh, what uh, we are observing in our organization, we have more than 76 patients, 76% of patients that, 70.1 uh, that completed the vaccination and 5.8 that are in running phase. There are some countries where we have some difficulties, but these are not related to our organization, but mainly to local problems. And unfortunately, it's very difficult for political reasons to support these countries. So what does it mean today, um, the evolution of medical performances under the COVID-19, the recovery of medical performances, less pressure of COVID-19 uh, outbreak in our clinics? In green, you can see the evolution of mortality rate uh, all in all EMEA organization. And you see that we faced an incredible peak in December 2020. You see the mortality rate uh, um, evaluated by number per deaths per 1,000 patients. So today, uh, I, I would like to say that we completely recovered what we observed as average 2017-2019, so 9.6. And considering only the COVID-19 uh, negative patients, in July, we did better compared to uh, the previous years. I'm confident that unfortunately, we will not improve, we will not further improve these numbers because we are facing with the beginning of the fourth wave and the mortality of COVID-19 positive patients will increase. But fortunately, which is the difference compared to the previous year? 
that today we have 76% of patients that are protected against the COVID-19 and uh, almost 81% of patients of employees that are protected against the COVID-19. So what is also important to state that our outcomes are also related to the ability of public hospitals to treat our patients when they must be hospitalized. So in terms of uh, patients starting the dialysis treatment, you see in the different uh, degree of blue uh, lines that there was a constant in 2017, 2018, and 2019, there was a constant increase during the year of new patients starting the dialysis treatment. In 2020, you see a dramatic reduction of new patients starting the dialysis treatment. So this is, I believe that is the impact of COVID-19 in CKD5 patients, not starting the, not yet in dialysis treatment, clearly. But in 2021, we are observing the same trend that we observed in the previous year, and I'm referring to 2017 to 2019. And you see the differences in terms of new patients starting dialysis treatment, benchmarking January with July. So uh, I would like to say that prevention is the best defense. An effective and safe vaccination strategy is currently the best option to drive down the COVID-19 infection risks. Waiting for all dialysis patients to have access to safe and effective vaccine against COVID-19, and also for those patients that completed the vaccination cycle and waiting for a booster dose, in Presenius Medical Care EMEA, we reinforce applying the following, we suggest to apply the following recommendation suggestion to prevent the cross-infection risks. So wear masks, wear the masks. I think that this is fundamental to protect patients, to protect employees. Uh, I would like to mention that uh, the seasonal flu that was observed in the previous year in our clinics is almost disappeared during the winter time. So again, we have to suggest to our physicians, to uh, clinical staff, and maybe to, to patients to wear masks. Reinforce the COVID-19 precautions and the gene measures in all diagnosis centers. Inform patients and their families about the COVID-19 transmission risks and what to do when they stay at home. It is really important. COVID-19 does not end, uh, risk does not end when the patients are in the ICS centers. And then, this is really important. Reduce, suspend shared rights and enforce obligatory sanitation protocols. We observe that this is one of the main reasons why we observe cross-infection among patients. Deliver the highest possible quality of care to diagnosis patients, mainly to those patients with diabetic disease and cardiovascular complications. So challenges in infrasenous medical care that we face in, uh, in the last 18 months. Treatment time reduction to the, adopt, uh, to the adopted additional hygiene measures in the clinics. So I insist, the right solution is to increase the quality of care delivered to the patients. So in terms to prevent dialysis dose reduction, interdialytic fluid overload, increased ultrafiltration filtra increase rate, intradialytic hypotensive episodes and arrhythmia episodes, acidosis, alkalosis spike, hyperkalemia risk, and increased hospitalization risk. So what I would like to, again, to state that we should take care not only for the COVID-19 positive patients, during the pandemic crisis, but mainly for the COVID-19 negative patients that are suffering from the increased hygiene measures adopted with the reduction of treatment time. So then increase the number of new and more complex incident patients with decompensated cardiovascular diseases and other uremic comorbidities starting the dialysis treatment. So we prepare an algorithm to suggest to our physicians how to start the dialysis treatment in new stable incidence patients and, in pre and how to continue in prevalent uh, dialysis patients. So this is the algorithm that is distributed in our dialysis centers to suggest what to do when the patients are starting the dialysis treatment and then see this is only for stable incidence patients, not patients crushing in dialysis. And then how to continue the dialysis treatment. Finally, which are the other challenges that we face? Increased number of patients starting the hemodiasis treatment with central venous catheters. 
So we observed that in many countries, the elective procedures for vascular access were reduced. And I think that we should have in each country a strong center for vascular access of diastasis patients. Shortage available nephrologists, this is a problem that we are facing in EMEA, sorry, in, uh, in Europe. And we must increase the education uh, of our physicians in our diastasis centers to reduce as much possible the enteralytic complications and uremic comorbidities. So then we have to increase the personalization. We have to improve the personalization of hemodialysis therapy. What does it mean? improve number of patients in home, in home hemodialysis. We should deliver more frequently four dialysis per week. And I'm convinced, personally convinced, that incremental dialysis during pandemic crisis can support to better treat those patients that have not to crush in dialysis. This is really important. So lockdown policies implemented. Again, apply digital solution more widely to remotely care and support CKD and SKD kidney disease patients. The patients are not to go to hospital. They must be controlled remotely by no digital solutions. Prevent hospitalization to the influ due to the influenza symptoms. Support and stimulate the seasonal flu vaccination. This is something that we have to restart immediately in our organization suggesting supporting the seasonal flu vaccination. Last point that already Dr. Magnitz mentioned. So what we should do in the future to evaluate the immune status of diabetes patients after the vaccination? Should we monitor the humoral and cellular immune response in end in stage kidney disease patients? So this is an important question that we have to understand. This is my last slide, and I would like to thank you all of you for your attention. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Stewart, for this uh, excellent uh, talk. And I'm sure that all of you out in the audience, you have uh, questions. Please use the question window. And I know actually that we already have received a number of interesting questions, both for Dr. Stewart and Maddox. So can I have the first question, please? So the immunization rates were dramatically different for patients and staff in Asia and Pacific. Uh, is it because of the vaccine shortage or vaccine hesitancy among the patients? Yeah, I'll, Who will I'll answer this. Yeah, I'll, I'll answer this, um, Professor Stenvenkel. I, I think in Asia Pacific, we saw that we were uh, all of the vac many of the vaccinations were in fact related specifically to the phasing of the government regulations of when vaccines were made available and started and which populations of people in the in the communities actually uh, were receiving those vaccines. So it has been um, uh, it started a little bit later than in some of the other continents in some of the Asian countries, which had done quite well during the early part of the pandemic. And uh, I think that the, um, uh, the access to vaccines was really dictated on a country by country basis, primarily that led to these uh, rates of where are we today in the vaccine uh, delivery. Thank you. Can I have the next question, please? And this is uh, for you, Dr. Stewart. Medical patient review was established in 2014 in FMC. How did the review mostly support your governance during COVID-19 pandemic? Well, thank you. This is a very wonderful question because I have to say that the medical governance system that is called medical patient review is something that is automatically running monthly in all our diocese centers where our database called UPD is implemented. So this is an automatic process that is done every month for all our patients, for all our diagnosis centers. And we are able to suggest the correct, immediately the corrective actions to our physicians, just in case we see a, a deviance from what we would like to see and what is got in the diagnosis centers. Thank you. Can I have the next question, please? And this is for you, Dr. Maddox. Recalling the slide with timeline of pandemic, 
pandemic waves in all regions. Was it possible to apply lessons learned in one region in another region with later onset of the pandemic? If yes, what would you mention as an example? Yeah, thank you. Um, it's an interesting question. Number one, at the beginning of the pandemic, I think we recognized what was happening in the early stages in Asia Pacific that clearly influenced, uh, at least in uh, both Europe and North America, how quickly we went to a much more aggressive masking and personal protective equipment use uh, model. That was sort of the earliest thing that I saw based on what we had seen from the earlier examples. The second, I think, was um, across regions, we recognized uh, when certain surges were occurring and there was an anticipation that a surge might uh, extend further at a slightly different time frame, we tried to make sure that we had um, shared the resources as best we could uh, in, uh, again, getting PPE, whether it's gowns, gloves, and masks, uh, to everybody. And I recall because of the Southern Hemisphere region in Latin America, that there was a very aggressive effort to try to get support from both Europe and North America to make sure that the Latin American countries, uh, when they suffered their surge, most recently, it was slightly earlier as they went into the winter months. So it was really in the late spring that that began for them, our late spring. And uh, so I think these things all allowed us the chance to kind of see how this virus was changing over the course of, uh, course of time. Early on, there was a huge opportunity to observe what was happening in Northern Italy. And I think the influence of what was happening in that region made a big impact on the aggressiveness of uh, the uh, non-pharmacologic interventions in the US. Thank you, Dr. Maddox. Can I have the next question, please? And this is for Dr. Stewart. Do you personally expect any fundamental changes in quality measure scores in dialysis patients after the COVID-19 pandemic? This is a very interesting question because today we are evaluating the patients according to some fixed parameters. So for example, KT over V, for example, uh, patients in target for treatment time. But the future for me is something completely different because we should not have at the center the numbers, but we should have at the center the patients. So we should focus after the COVID-19, I believe, how to improve the quality of life of our patients, but assuring to the patients the best quality of therapy that is possible to deliver to them. So for me, the future is to try to improve as much possible the quality of life of the patients. And for my personal point of view, and for what I am responsible as physician uh, in, in a dialysis organization, is to reduce as much possible the complications that patients are facing in dialysis and related to the dialysis treatment. So I'm referring, for example, how to reduce the intradialytic complications, how to reduce the cardiovascular complications related to the dialysis treatment, how to reduce the consequences of fluid overload in dialysis patients. This is, I think, how to better manage dialysis patients in the future, evaluating different quality indicators. Thank you for this answer. Can I have the next question, please? So this is maybe for both of you. Do you think dialysis patients should have three doses as standard vaccination? Stefano, you want to go first? <laughs> because it's a difficult question. <laughs> yes, absolutely yes. Uh, I think that patients should receive a booster dose, absolutely, because they are immunodepressed patients, but I would like to say that as, for example, normally we are doing for hepatitis B vaccination, we should control what we are doing in dialysis patients. So managing, evaluating the cellular response, evaluating the humoral response after the vaccination. But the information that we have, if the different governments are suggesting a booster dose for normal population and also for fragile patients, why dialysis patients should not receive a booster dose? 
So this is a normal consequence of the normal attitude of all scientists in the world, I believe. So I think the, from my perspective, the discussion is ongoing about the value of uh, an additional dose. And I distinguish an additional dose to a standard vaccination protocol from a booster dose. Uh, I certainly think when you look at the response rate in our patients, it's quite high, but the level of that response is highly variable. And the variability of that response for many patients, I think, would engender a reasonable physician response that an additional dose to achieve an immune response that's comparable to the general population would be advisable. So in general, I am... Um, uh, I mean, I would be in favor of the additional dose uh, for a patient with end-stage kidney disease or, you know, advanced stage four, stage five, uh, non-dialysis kidney disease. They are clearly a highly, highly vulnerable population, uh, probably uh, as high or only second to the nursing home population of patients at risk. And Frank, I, I can tell that in uh, Sweden, the uh, patients with end-stage kidney failure and renal transplant patients will now be offered a third booster dose during the autumn. Yes, that's uh, true. Can I have the year. next? Yeah. yeah. Can I have the next question, please? Uh, perhaps it's worth supplementing uh, the measures to combat COVID-19 with a wider introduction of peritoneal dialysis in the context of a pandemic. Who can address this question? So I'll take this one. I think the um, it's important to remember that slide I showed that the rate of COVID-19 exposure is directly related to the background rate in the community that the individual lives in. And what we have found is the intensive um, hygiene efforts within the clinic uh, have been studied quite carefully. And although the communal environment is in general something to try to avoid. Uh, I think we've been able to show that we, we think in very few cases was that actually a vector to increased infection rates. Uh, and and it was uh, there was a substantial amount. One of the papers we published was actually a very detailed analysis of, of that when you looked at where patients sat in a chair next to other patients and other such things. Nevertheless, I do think that for many people, the ability to um, control their community exposures is quite different if they're dialyzing at home. And in that case, I would think the introduction of peritoneal dialysis more widely would be beneficial. And uh, I think it uh, really depends on the degree of vaccination and hygiene measures within the family and the community environment that the patient lives in, because that's really where their greatest risk is. Thank you. And now we have the last question. Let's see what that is. Countries with high vaccine rates are experiencing localized outbreaks in dialysis units. While vaccination has led to a reduction in severity, it's likely to interfere with getting back to normal in a dialysis patient care. What are your thoughts? Stefano, you want to go first or I'll, I can go first? Yes, yes, yes. Um, we have the example of Israel. They started immediately to vaccinate the entire population. And now they are requesting immediately to start a booster dose on facultative way. So I agree, I agree. And so, so in general, I would, I would respond as well that it's going, the, the question is what is normal going to be in the future and, and in, my view, the pandemic will eventually uh, evolve into an endemic. And despite the um, remarkable role that vaccination has played in trying to um, modify the experience with the pandemic, I think that we're gonna see continued issues related to coronavirus um, sort of leak into spots over the world, across the world, for some time now, and I think in general, we're going to find our attention to 
hand hygiene, our attention to non-pharmaceutical <laughs> interventions to prevent viral transmission of any kind are going to be extremely great. And I do think that the vaccines will continue to get better as we look at what the next version of the vaccines is going to look like towards uh, whatever the coronavirus evolves to through its its mutations. So I think um, I think we have some number of years to still to still be dealing with um, coronavirus in general. I think the concept of what normal looks like is already beginning to uh, look more like normal. But we still have a long way to go, I think, before we actually uh, feel like we are rid of this particular uh, infection. So uh, here I'd like to thank both Dr. Maddox and uh, Stuart for excellent uh, presentations and erudite answers to tricky questions. And for you out in the audience, um, I'd like to thank you for attending this 18th uh, webinar. It's the last of a series of webinars and I hope you have enjoyed them. So now, uh, in two weeks from today, the uh, live 2021 Nephrology Congress uh, will open. I hope you register. I can guarantee that there will be a very nice, interesting program, whatever part of nephrology care you are involved in. So see you in two weeks. Bye.